Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 minutes. My name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today we are going to discuss the age of Chaldeos. Now this lecture here is not nearly as cram-packed as the last one talking about the Mexican-American War, but it is equally as important. Now if you look at these things here, uh, as a preface to this, and we're going to talk about neocolonialism in another place, but uh, Latin America has seen that it got independence. You've seen that Latin America got its independence in the 1820s for the most part. There are a few exceptions to this, uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico in particular, but we're talking about the 1820s. Most of Latin America got their independence politically. However, what they found is that they were dependent economically on other countries. And these two countries are going to be Great Britain uh, for the 19th century and then the United States for the 20th century. In other words, they get to rule themselves, but are they truly independent since they don't get to control their own economy? And the reason is being is because of the, uh, the wars for independence were so disastrous that they need some quick money. And so they're going to have quick money by focusing on things such as free trade and major exports of products, especially in terms of single products, in terms of monoculture. As a result of that, you see that Latin America began to grow economically, but they didn't really develop the skills that's going to make them to be self-sufficient. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so with this in mind, much of Latin America is going to see themselves stagnating. Although throughout the 19th centuries, the elite are going to see that they're going to do much better economically. Right? They're going to have cool cities with great steam travel and everything. Much of the rural masses, they're going to survive. They're going to, nothing's going to change for them. It, it, with the exception of some places, it actually got worse for much of the masses. Okay, so, therefore, uh, a lot of violence is going to occur. And as you study about the early days of every single country, with the exception of Brazil, you're going to see that there's a lot of overthrow of the governments and new, uh, newly minted constitutions. So people are going to turn to strong men to try to reimpose authority. These strong men are going to be called Caudillos. Now, if the Caudillos get most of their power from the elite, they're going to be called elite Caudillos. If the Caudillos get most of their power from the masses, they're going to be called folk Caudillos. So there are two types of Caudillos, elite and folk. The first one, the elite Caudillos. Here's a great quote that I pulled out of a history textbook that I used when I was an undergraduate 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. It says, I neither want nor like ministers who can think. I want only ministers who can write, because the only one who can think am I, and the only one who does think am I. The elite Chaldeos, they want to get mass I mean, support from the elites, and they want to rule themselves, right? And have people carry it out. A great example of that is, we've already discussed, General Santa Ana, who took power no less than 11 different times and then set it aside. He was a Caudillo, a strong man. He represented a continuation of the past, right? And that means the elites in charge. The masses, no. The elites, yes. So in this case, you got the rural aristocracy. They support the elite Caudillos, the big landowners that have major export earnings. The Roman Catholic Church, since it's a continuation of the past, the elite Caudillos, uh, oftentimes, but not always conservative, represents the continuation of the Roman Catholic Church and the pro-clericalism that's associated with it. And number three, the army. For example, Santa Ana always had a huge army, and so they support the elite Caudillo. So you have Caudillos, and this is the age of Caudillos, because in order to represent stability, you got these strongmen coming about. You also have, however, uh, Caudillos that oftentimes get support uh, from the masses. These are the folk Caudillos, right? Uh, they promise things to the masses, like economic stability, and based on their ability to give it to them, then they get support from the masses. A give and take relationship. Five great examples that we're going to cover in super quick detail, Dr. Francia uh, and these others here. Uh, why? Because by understanding these caldeos, uh, folk and elite, we understand the history of the early uh, uh, half century or so of independence in Latin America. And that is violent, and so therefore people turn to somebody to impose stability. Here's a great example. 
The first one, Dr. Jose Gaspar Rodriguez de Francia. This is a dictator in the country of Paraguay. Now, Paraguay, I don't know why I said it like that, but Paraguay was part of, according to uh, Argentina, uh, was part of the newly independent country called the United Provinces uh, of La Plata, right? Which included Paraguay, uh, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, and sometimes it included Uruguay as well, but it was having a problem with Brazil, so that generally was not part of the issue there. Paraguay said, no, we don't belong to you because of nationalism. We are different than you in Argentina. Argentina was much wealthier. Argentina was more European, especially as they kept on bringing immigrants in. Paraguay, however, was more self-sufficient internally and was made up of much more of uh, the Guarani Indians. If you ever watch the movie The Mission, you got a little bit of a sense of that area right there. So under the new dictator, they decreased exports in order to become self-sufficient. If you go to many stores, you might see yerba mate that had been a traditional export, right? Which is tea, this uh, yerba tea, uh, herbal type tea, right? And so then you reduce your the the dependence on exports, and he created something called the Estancias de la Patria, which are like lands of the fatherland, and made it so that, so that everybody could work but you worked in order to be self-sufficient. He was a dictator. He was a caudillo. But people supported him because he made sure that everybody had a reasonable standard of living. But that means that the rich people, the elites, they don't get to export some of these major crops. So they don't get rich. So then they hate the situation. Okay, so Dr. Francia was a caudillo. When he steps down, the strongman Antonio Antonio Carlos Lopez, which I don't have his picture, comes to power. And at his death, then you have uh, Francisco Solano Lopez, that it looks like I cut this off. It's supposed to say 1863 to 1870. And so it comes to power. Well, in the end, this country, Paraguay, is going to fight a war called the War of the Triple Alliance in the other countries, but in Paraguay is going to be called the Paraguayan War. He's going to fight a war against Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil, right? And in this case, here's a better map, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, and three against one, you can imagine what's going to happen. Paraguay is going to lose, the other three are going to win. Another example of a, dictate, of a dictator that's called the Caudillo, Jean-Pierre Boyer. This example of a Caudillo comes from Haiti. Haiti, as you saw before, declared its independence officially in 1805, uh, but from that point until 1818, there was a great deal of agitation in the country. One of the causes of the agitation is the, well, there's many causes, right? But I was going to say one of the causes is the mulattoes versus the Africans that are now Afro-Haitians, uh, right? Another thing is that since they did come from Africa, many of them, in Africa is such a huge place that if you cram all those diverse peoples into Haiti, that doesn't mean they're all the same, right? And so they have different desires, different goals, different everything, and it led to a lot of agitation. The second president of the Republic of Haiti comes to power in 1818, and he rules as a caudillo, a dictator for the benefit of the people. And at this point, of course, Haiti is still one of those pariahs of the Western Hemisphere because most countries still have slavery, the United States, uh, 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 what am I saying? Every place had, had slavery, right, uh, for the most part. And so he's like this pariah right here. But here he makes sure that everybody has a little plot of land. The language that now develops, since they are self-sufficient, everybody, former slaves, has a little bit of land to work on. Uh, it's called patois, the combination of French and, uh, uh, and the African di different dialects here. So if you go to... Uh, Haiti, for example, and you speak French, it might be a little bit uh, different. They might have a difficult time understanding you. The religious tradition is a combination also of uh, Catholicism and African religions called voodoo, Vodum, uh, here. And so it's a much unique, different place. There is another Caldeo. So we got two Caldeos. Here's another Caldeo, Juan Manuel Rosas, 1829 to 1852. Uh, this is at the same time of all these other things going on that we've been talking about. Just south of Argentina is, I mean, of uh, Paraguay is Argentina, and this dictator 
comes to power to try to reimpose stability in this country. Juan Manuel Rosas, however, uh, depending on which way you look at him, is not the nicest person. Uh, you have two different political parties, as I said before, liberals and conservatives. I also emphasized before in previous lectures that sometimes the liberals aren't called liberals, they have a different name. Federales in this case, and the conservatives were called the Unitarios. Well, this person, uh, Juan Manuel Rosas, it gets support of the masses. Who are the masses at this time in Argentina? Mostly is the cowboys of the interior. This, if you look over here, this is called the Pampas. The Pampas are the Great Plains here, over here. And the cowboys are called the Gauchos. The Gauchos that are living here, therefore, get the, give their support to this dictator, who in turn protects them and gives them land when needed and, and support. Unfortunately, he's not going to live forever. All of these caudillos are eventually going to uh, either die uh, in office, a couple of them did, or else are going to be defeated miserably by the liberals or other peoples, depending on which group of people we're talking about. So Manuel Rosas comes uh, to, a, uh, to an end, goes to exile in England. In 1853, the liberals come to power, right? Of course, that doesn't mean the agitations come about, but nonetheless, uh, ooh, I spelled that wrong. Nonetheless, uh, you got this great example of Manuel Rosas as well, a caudillo to come to power in Latin America to try to reimpose stability on, an agitate, on this agitation. Rafael Carrera, also 1839-1865. This is a more interesting example. It's a more interesting example because remember that the United Province of Central America had been part of the Empire of Mexico. But during the agitations of the anti-monarchist movement, which kicked out uh, Augustine the first, Iturbide, then they declared their independence from Mexico, and then they realized that they don't have that much in common with each other. So even though they were a country, the United Provinces of Central America, one country, different regions began to fight amongst each other and different peoples within those regions, right? People in El Salvador and Nicaragua, within one of those countries, they'll have liberals and conservatives fighting against each other as well. And so that leads to a great deal of uprising. Whoops. And in the end, uh, uh, Rafael Carrera is going to reimpose stability on Central America. However, because he's more concerned with Guatemala than the rest of the uh, uh, Central America, he allows the breakup of Central America. And to this very present, Central America has been divide into individual republics. It's not a centralized country anymore. Last but not least, we have a great example of Manuel Balzu in Bolivia. Another example of a strong man called the, right, uh, Caudillo. Uh, he ruled from 1848 to 1855, uh, imposing authority. All these great examples, in the last minute that we have, we should emphasize this. 1820s to 1830s, you got liberal dominance. 1840s to 1860s, you have conservative dominance. Especially the 1840s and 1860s, although not uh, ignoring the earlier period of 20s and 30s, you have people with all the agitations coming to power as a strong men. From the 1860s to the 1900s, the liberals come back to power. However, they are more concerned with a new thing that we'll talk about next time uh, called progress. And because of all this progress that they're concerned with, oftentimes they appear less liberals, less liberal than the conservatives. So throughout this period, is there change or is there continuity? The elite caudillos want continuity. The liberals state that they want change. The result of the two is going to be a great deal of agitation and caudillos are going to come to power to write, try to reimpose stability. And I gave you a quick, super quick example of five caudillos of Latin America that tries to reimpose stability. Now my advice at this point is to say, okay, what countries did uh, Dr. Richardson talk about? And make sure you know where those countries are. Because if we're trying to understand the history of Latin America beyond, uh, we have to understand where the different places are. And that is what we should do. Change or continuity? Not sure. But that's history of Latin America, modern Latin America, in 15 minutes.